be climbing up this vertical chunk of ice, kicking in our crampons up the mountain. If those puppies aren't sharp, we slip and fall. Where we come from, that's a bad thing. As that glacier slides along the cliff, it busts up. And during the day, this thing will move approximately a meter, a meter and a half each day. My next uh, journey will maybe be next uh, Christmas, uh, something, a contrast to Everest. Uh, Everest was cold and steep, now I'm looking for something flat and hot, and so a desert traverse perhaps. And you get up there and you look at the mountain, it's so huge, dominating the skyline, scraping the clouds, and you think, God, there's just no way we were going to be able to climb this mountain. The enormity of the thing overwhelmed us. The project was too big, and we sat there. I think if you'd polled the group at that point, nine out of ten of the climbers would have said, I say we take some pictures and just get the hell out of here. Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we all have those fears. You don't have to go to Mount Everest to find this kind of fear. We have it every day. Alan mentioned rejection. The fear of rejection can be so intense that it creates a paralysis and you don't want to pick up the phone, you don't want to network, you don't want to make the move because you get beaten back and it seems just too big to beat that fear. What we did on the mountain that helped us in 91, which might help you as you push through that fear of rejection, is we would not try to think of all the mountain or all the work that you have to do at once. We would just think of the tiny steps that we could do now. The next person to contact, pick up the phone, make a phone call. The first step that we had to take to break the paralysis is always the most difficult. Everest does not climb to one big leap to the top. You plant the flag and get to the top. It's a <laughs> slow process, day in, day out, step after step after step after step. And that's the same way that you'll get to the peak that you're trying to climb. Every day, prospect after prospect after prospect after prospect after prospect, a little rejection, prospect after prospect, prospect after prospect. That's how you get to the top. Good evening. A Canadian mountain climber came close to the top of Mount Everest today and close to death. At one point, John collapsed into the snow for 35 minutes and didn't move. Knowing that it would take us several hours to get from where we were to up to him to save him, we knew he had to keep moving. And we panicked that we would sit and watch our friend freeze to death, die in the snow above us. At that point, in our panic, we came up with the idea to pull out our satellite phone system. We hooked it up. We placed a call back to North America, to a small mountain town in Alberta called Jasper. And there, half a world away, John's two little girls, his two daughters, Alicia and Leanne, were asleep. And the phone rang, woke them up, shared with them what was up with their dad. Didn't share the severity of the situation because we didn't want to scare the girls, but hoped that their voices would trigger something with their father. They got on the phone and started talking to John. He could hear them through his radio clipped to his climbing suit. And they, they were sort of joking with him at first that you know, it was May, they wanted to come home, it was summer vacation soon, how was he doing? But John's only response was silence. And of course now we sank with depression and sadness in camp realizing what had transpired. And the girls showed incredible strength. Rather than breaking down like we did, they just held strong and almost got angry with their dad and started to remind him of a promise that, that he had made. When John left North America, he promised his two little girls that he would not die on Mount Everest. And they sat there and said, Dad, don't forget your promise. And you better not die up there. I had a great sense of gratitude and a sense that I had to give something back. And that explains why I'm here and why I continue to speak. I think the necessary to give something back because I was so fortunate. And the big thing that resonates in my mind is that along the way, you set those goals, you get your butt kicked, you get hit by avalanches, you have setbacks, you have failures, and those failures are the essence, the building blocks of future success. They're integral. Without them, you can't have the victory because you learn so much from them. But the pressure is to get it right the first time. It doesn't work. And what I've learned is that it's okay to fail. It's just not okay to fold. You can't give up, and you can't quit. We're going back to Mount Everest 
for the third time because we refuse to give up. And this time we surround ourselves with the best team possible, part of whom are standing here today with us, Lotus. So whether you like it or not, you're going to the top of the world in the spring of this year. And in May of 1997, about 9.15 a.m., we'll take May the 12th. It's always good to know what you're trying to shoot for. We will stand on top, and in our hands, blowing in the 80 kilometer an hour winds, will be the lotus yellow flag. <laughs> Hammer on top of the world.